All right, welcome to section 4.1 from OpenStax Precalculus. Uh, in this section, we're talking about exponential functions. Really, in this chapter, chapter 4, we learn about exponential and logarithmic functions. Um, and logarithms are something that gives a lot of students trouble. It turns out they're very related to exponents or exponential functions. So really, you can think about this section as a good foundation for what will come up later in this chapter that gives a lot of people trouble. So a little friendly advice, maybe spend a little bit more time on this section, really understand this, um, and it will benefit you when you get to later of chapter 4. Okay, so at any rate, it's exponential functions. What is an exponential function? Well, really an exponential function is something that looks like this. Why? Maybe I'll even write this. Exponential is a function that takes on this form. A times B to the X power. Um, not to be confused with, but I guess similar to linear functions. So this is what we learned about in chapter 2. And that's y equals mx plus b. In fact, there are a lot of parallels between exponential and linear functions. So I'm going to kind of uh, write these next to each other and deal with both of these in this chapter, even if linear functions is more review. Um, so an exponential function, first thing you want to do is be able to recognize one. E the easiest way to recognize one is when you see an x up in the exponent. Whatever your variable is, typically x, sometimes t. When that's up in the exponent, there's a good chance you have an exponential function. Uh, what you're looking for is a number times some other number raised up to your variable. If you have that case, you have an exponential function. That's not entirely true. Um, we want There's some constraints on these constants a and b here. Uh, it turns out that we will not let a equal 0. You might be able to convince yourself of why that's true. Um, with linear functions, m and b can be whatever the hell you want them to be. With exponential functions, we kind of put these restrictions in here. A cannot be equal to zero here. It could be equal to one, it could be equal to a negative number, just can't be equal to zero. B, um, there's more restrictions. B cannot be zero, it cannot be one, it cannot be negative. So one way you can describe all that is you could say B must be a positive number other than one. So make sure you understand what that means. Uh, B can't be negative 3, B can't be 0, and B can't be positive 1, B can't be any negative number. Um, these are restrictions on A and B, and as we go through some examples and we evaluate some, we'll see why uh, it's, I don't know about important, why it makes sense to have these restrictions here. Okay, so this is all getting kind of theoretical. Let's actually get into some examples. So a perfectly good example of an exponential function might be Y equals... Um, I don't know, 3 times 2 to the x power. And I'll put the little dot in here so it doesn't look like 32 to the x power. 32 to the x power would be a perfectly fine exponential function. Just a would be equal to 1. 1 times 32 to the x. That would work. Um, but that's not what I want here. I want 3 times 2 to the x. Here's an example of an exponential function. Um, and to keep my parallels with linear functions, I also want to look at y equals 2x plus 3. I want to compare the two of these guys here. So note that over here, my value of a would be equal to 3, and my value of b would be equal to 2. Uh, whereas over here, my value of m would be equal to 2, and my value of b would be equal to 3. Somewhat confusingly, uh, the a over here is very similar to the b over here. It's unfortunate that we use different letters. And the B over here is very similar to the M over here. So it's kind of strange that these two guys pair up. Maybe I'll even draw an arrow between the two of them. These will be similar in some sense that I'll make more concrete. And these will be similar in some sense that I'll make more concrete. And that's already confusing because it's weird that the B isn't similar to the B. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Okay, so what do they all mean? First of all, let's go back to the linear functions. In a linear function, the M is the slope. And really, the way you can think about it is it's what you add to y every time x increases by 1. And that's not the definition we first used to define slope. 
Um, but maybe since you're through chapter two and you're kind of an expert on linear functions, you can be like, yeah, that's equivalent to how I think of what slope means. So what you add to the y value every time x increases by one. And b is what's called the y-intercept. And you can think about it as uh, the y value when x equals zero. So using these two definitions for M and B, um, I want to come up with similar definitions for A and B over here. So remember that B is the one that's similar to M. So I'm going to first figure out B. I don't have a fancy name for B. Like M and B over here are slope and y-intercept. I don't have fancy names for A and B over here. So I'm just going to call it B. And what B is, B equals, I guess, what you multiply important I'm gonna underline that which you multiply y by each time you increase x by 1 uh, so note that B cannot be 0 and that makes sense right if B were 0 you're multiplying by 0 every time you increase x by 1. But if you multiply by 0, it's always equal to 0. You don't really have any interesting behavior going on. So you wouldn't get something that's undefined or anything bad like that. It just wouldn't be interesting, so we don't let b equal 0. Similarly, if b is equal to 1, multiplying by 1 doesn't really do anything. And just because it's not interesting, we exclude that over here. Uh, b cannot be a negative number. And the reason why there gets kind of interesting, I'll put that on hold for a little while, but it'll turn out having something to do with not being able to take the square root of a negative number. But really what I want to do now is just compare these two b's. Over here, you're adding something to the y-coordinate every time x increases by 1. Over here, you're multiplying the y-coordinate by something every time x is increasing by 1. So they're very similar. It's just a different operation of what's going on. a, well, it turns out a is the y-intercept. Um, so I can use the exact same definition here. It's the y-value when x equals 0. And you're like, wait, how does that work out? Like over here, it's kind of obvious. If x equals 0, 2 times 0 is 0. So if x equals 0, then y would just be equal to 3. But over here, maybe it's not quite as obvious. But the reason this works out is because 2 to the 0 power equals 1. And really, that's true for any b. b to the 0 power is always equal to 1. So no matter what b is, when I raise it to the 0 power, I get 1. So when I plug 0 into this equation, this is all 1. So 3 times 1 would just give me a 3. So whatever is taking the role of a, in this case 3, is going to be the output for this function when you put 0 into it. So that's why you get your y-intercept here. Um, and note, anything to the 0 power equals 1, that's a bit of a lie. Uh, 0 to the 0 power is undefined. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that weird case because we don't allow b to be equal to 0. So that's kind of nice. Anything other than 0 to the 0 power is equal to 1. This might be a strange fact to you that 2 to the 0 is equal to 1. Um, I think I explained that somewhere. It's true. Trust me. So that's kind of the meaning of a and b. And in my mind, it helps a lot to compare these with the linear functions here. Um, let's actually get into some examples here. Evaluating exponential functions. So I have this exponential function. I guess right here I have an exponential equation. So let's write it in functional notation. f of x is equal to 3 times 2 to the x power. So I can figure things out. I could figure out like what is f of 3, for example. And to figure out f of 3, all I do is I copy this thing down, except everywhere I see an x, I replace it with a 3. So it'd be 3 times 2 to the third power. And here you want to be a little bit careful with your order of operations. You do exponents before you do multiplication. So I don't want to do 3 times 2, 6, and cube that. I instead want to cube this 2 because I do exponents before multiplication. 2 cubed is 8, and 3 times 8 gives me 24. So be a little bit careful there with your order of operations. Um, okay, here's something that's kind of interesting. What about f of negative 1? Well, I can follow my blueprint and just say that's 3 times 2 to the negative 1 power. But now you have to recall what does it mean to raise something to a negative exponent. And to raise something to a negative exponent sort of means take the reciprocal of. So instead of 3 times 2 to the negative 1 power, I can make it 3 divided by 2 to the positive 1 power. I can get rid of the negative 
if I write it down on the bottom here, and since 2 to the 1 power is just 2, I get this is equal to 3 halves. Similarly, if I had f of negative 3, I'd say that's 3 times 3 to the negative 3 power. Sorry, 3 times 2 to the negative 3 power. Wrote too many 3's there. Which would be 3 divided by 2 to the 3rd power. Same logic I did here. The negative exponent means take the reciprocal of. So since it used to be on the top, it's now down on the bottom. And as I saw before, 2 to the 3rd power is 8, so I get 3 8's here. Uh, similarly, I get I could figure out f of 0 by just taking this equation and plugging in a 0 everywhere I see an x. And now you recall that 2 to the 0 power is 1, so I get 3 times 1 is 3, which follows what I was saying over here. Uh, whatever the value of a is, 3 in this case, is the y value when x equals 0. No, you put in 0 and 3 comes out. Uh, something kind of interesting is f of a fraction, like 1 half. Following my blueprint, I get 3 times 2 to the 1 half power. But now, just like up here, I had to remember what it means to have a negative exponent. Now I have to remember what it means to have a fractional exponent. And what it means is the numerator is the power that I'm going to raise this up to. The denominator is the root that I'm going to take. So this 2 here means take the square root of this base. You can make that a little bit more general by figuring out f of 3 quarters. That'd be 3 times 2 to the 3 quarter power, which would be 3 times the 4th root of 2 to the 3rd power, which I could write as 3 times the 4th root of 8. That's how you evaluate some exponential functions. Really, the two takeaways here are negative exponents, mean reciprocal and fractional exponents involve roots. Uh, if you get that, you should be able to evaluate any of these exponential functions. Maybe I'll give one more quick example here. I could say g of x is equal to 1 half times 3 quarters to the x power. It's a perfectly good exponential function. Let's even make this negative 1 half. Why not? Perfectly good exponential function. a is equal to negative 1 half and b is equal to 3 quarters. And if you look up at your restrictions on a and b, those are both allowed. All right, a just cannot be equal to 0. It's not. It's negative 1 half. B must be positive and it can't be 1. B is positive and it ain't 1. All right, looks like this will work. So how could we evaluate this? Well, let's figure out G of 0. It's kind of a trick question in that it's pretty easy um, because G of 0, you could think of in a couple different ways. You could say that G of 0 is just asking me what is the value of A because right? A is always the Y value when X equals 0. And I'm saying that X equals 0 right here. So it must be equal to negative 1 half, a right here. If you want to go through the steps to show why that's true, you could. And come down to the fact that 3 quarters to the 0 power is just 1 because anything to the 0 power, except for 0, but we don't have to worry about that, is equal to 1. Um, and 1 times negative 1 half would just be negative 1 half. What about g negative 1? I get negative one-half times three-fourths to the negative one power. And so I'd have negative one-half times the reciprocal of three-fourths, so times four-thirds. And now I can go canceling things out and get negative, well, you could either multiply straight across and get four-sixths negative, or you could cancel this four and this two to get negative two-thirds. Um, and you could do the same thing with roots, everything else. But I just want to give an example where there's some fractions. Maybe I'll call that good and say that that's enough evaluating exponential functions. Um, finding an equation from two points is an interesting thing to do. So we'll move on to that next. So recall that when you have a linear function, you can come up with the equation of that linear function. You can use slope-intercept form or sometimes point-slope form is a good uh, intermediate form to get you into slope-intercept form. 
But we have ways. If I give you two points and I tell you you have a linear function, there's a way for you to figure out what linear function you're talking about. Well, I can give you two points and tell you you have an exponential function, and you could find the equation of it. So the first thing is you have to be told that you have an exponential function. Find equation of exponential function passing through. And now I'll pick some points. I don't know, maybe when uh, x equals 1, y is equal to 6. And when x is equal to negative 2, see if I can make this work out nicely in my head, y is equal to 3 fourths. I think this will work out nice. Uh, find the equation of the exponential function passing through these points. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, generally, these questions will come in two flavors. The first flavor, I guess, the easy type, is when you are told the y-intercept. Right? If you are told, if instead of saying 1, 6 here, this said 0, 6, you would be really, really happy. Right? Maybe you don't realize how happy you'd be, but if I tell you it goes through the point 0, 6, then what I'm telling you is that when x equals 0, y equals 6. Wait a minute. If x equals 0, the y value is just a. So if this goes through the point 0, 6, you are told that a is equal to 6. You immediately know a. Unfortunately, we don't have that in this case. But keep that in mind that if one of your two points, the x-coordinate is ever 0, you automatically know a, which will make this problem a whole lot simpler. So I'm going to start with the harder example, this example here, where neither of the points you're given uh, an x value of 0. And so what do you do? Well, there's kind of a trick to it. And the trick is what's called dividing equations. So what we're going to do is we're going to write our exponential function, y equals a times b to the x power. But we're going to admit that we don't know what a and b are. So all I can do is leave them as a and b. But I do know that when x equals 1, y equals 6. So I can say 6 equals a times b to the 1 power by plugging in this point. And by plugging in this point, I could say 3 quarters is equal to a times b to the negative 2 power. So I have these two equations right here. And I have two equations and two unknowns, which is something that we may have seen already in another chapter. There's a way you can solve equations when you have two unknowns and two separate equations. So I want to figure out what a and b are equal to. And there's a lot of different ways you can do this. I think the uh, most natural way people think to do this is to solve for one of the variables and then substitute that in the other equation. There's actually a much easier way to do it. And it's this trick of dividing equations. If this equals this and this equals this, then this divided by this must be equal to this divided by this. So what I can do is I can say 6 divided by 3 fourths, which is kind of a mess, but I'll deal with that in just a minute, is equal to ab to the 1 power over ab to the negative 2 power. I chose to make this on top and this on the bottom. You could have done that differently if you wanted. It makes no difference. And so how does this help? I mean, it looks like I just mashed one equa two equations into one. Well, the nice thing that happens here is the a's cancel out. Right? Because I have multiplication going on in this fraction, an a in the top and in the bottom, I can cancel out those a's. And that's nothing special with this problem. That'll always happen because you'll always have a and then b to some exponent and a, b to some exponent. Those a's will always cancel when you divide the equations. And 6 divided by 3 fourths, well, you can think about that as 6 over 1 times 4 over 3. Dividing fractions is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So really what I have here is 24 thirds, a.k.a. 8. So on the left side here, I just have an 8. And on the right side, my a's cancel, and I have b to the 1 divided by b to the negative 2 power. Uh, but you may remember or may have learned at some point that when you are dividing exponents uh, and you have the exact same base here, you can subtract the number up in the exponent here. So 1 minus negative 2 is just 3. So, okay, this might have, there's a lot of little tricks going on here and you might think that this is going to be really challenging to do. The nice thing is that we're always going to follow this blueprint. So anytime you have two points, and neither of those points have an x value of 0. Those are the hard types of questions. What you're going to do is first write two equations. And that's easy enough, right? This is the x, this is the y. Just go substitute those in, write two equations. Then you're going to divide, write things like this. 
The algebra of dividing is a little bit tricky, but all you have to do is if you're dividing fractions here, remember the little trick that dividing fractions is multiplying by the reciprocal of the denominator. In other words, take the fraction down on the bottom and flip it upside down and make it a multiplication problem. Then remember that your a's are always going to cancel out. That wasn't special with this problem. That'll always happen. And then your b's, you're always going to subtract the exponents. You're going to take the one on the top and subtract the one on the bottom. So 1 minus negative 2 is 3. And be careful. Make sure you subtract the negative. Don't subtract positive 2. This is a negative 2 here. Um, and that gets you here. And wait a minute. If 8 equals b to the third power, I can take the cubed root of both sides of the equation to figure out that b is equal to 2. And that's really good news because the minute I know that b is equal to 2, I can figure out what a is equal to because I can go back to either of these two equations, whichever one looks easier to you. I think it's this first one right here. I can say 6 equals a times 2 to the 1 power because I know b is equal to 2. In other words, 6 is equal to 2a, so therefore a is equal to 3. Um, so what I now have is a and b, and so I know that the equation of my exponential function is y equals a times b to the x power. And so this is what I get as my answer. You can check your answer. Um, if you plug in a 1 here, I get 3 times 2 to the 1 power, which is 3 times 2, which is 6, sure enough. If you plug in a negative 2, 2 to the negative 2 power is the same as 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 fourth. And 3 times 1 fourth is 3 fourths, which is what I get over here. So it looks like that works. Um, this might seem like just, okay, that works in this specific case. This is something you'll be doing a fair amount, and you'll see it in different settings. So I'll go through several examples showing you how to do this kind of stuff. But this is a really good example to make sure it makes sense to you. Um, note that if, do I even want to do it? If this were 0, 6, if I gave you two points, I said 0, 6, and then some other point over here, the minute this is 0, 6, you know that a is equal to 6 because that's what a is defined to be is the y value when x equals 0. So if I give you x equals 0, y equals 6, you know that a is 6. And if you know that a is 6, you can take your other equation, the equation that came from the other point, and you can plug in 6 for a, and you'll be able to figure out what b is. So if you're in the case where one of these two values gives you an x value of 0, you're very happy. You don't have to divide any equations. You don't have to do any of that stuff. It'll be a lot easier to do. And rather than do an example of that now, I'll do some examples when I go through the books uh, for this chapter. All right, so I'll finish this section up with an application of exponential functions. Uh, where does this stuff come up? Well, it comes up in a lot of places, but one of the examples you'll typically see is this compound interest formula. So I went ahead and wrote down the formula for you, which I suppose you can just memorize if you're a memorization kind of person. But I'd recommend kind of understanding why it works or how it works rather than just memorize this thing. So to that end, let me kind of talk you through it. Uh, what this is telling you is the account balance, so how much money you have, at time t. So you start out with some amount, which I'm calling p here, and that's how your initial balance, how much you start out with. And how much you end up with after t years is what you'll have over here on the left side. And the way you figure it out is you start, you take whatever you start out with, and you multiply it by something some number of times. If you're really clever, you might see how this is an exponential function, right? This p right here is playing the role of little a, and this entire thing in the parentheses is playing the role of b, and playing the role of x is this n to the t power, a times b to the x. Note that p, the initial balance, is playing the role of a, and a is the y-intercept, which is how what the function's value is at time zero, which is exactly what the initial balance would be. That makes sense. And then you multiply it by this amount, so this is your value of b, a certain number of times, this is your x up here. Uh, the r is the interest rate, which really is the APR, um, which is a little bit interesting, I guess. You end up earning, if you compound more than once a year, you end up earning a greater percent than what's stated here. So you might say r is 10%. Okay, so after a year, I have 10% more than what I started with, but that's not the case if you compound more than once in a given time period, which is kind of interesting, I guess. Um, a t is the number of time periods you have, typically they're measured in year, and is the number of times you compound in that time period, typically years. So, for example, I could say, you suppose you earn 20% APR, and you start out with 100 bucks, and you compound every six months. How much would you have at the end of one year? What I would be asking you then is, 
well, how about this? First, come up with a function that tells you how much you have at any time period. Well, then I'd be saying, all right, A of T equals, I start out with 100 bucks, and then one plus, if my interest rate is 20%, I could write 0 0.20 here. And yes, you could just write 0 0.2 if you felt like it. Uh, I put the 0 0.20 in there to really emphasize it's 20%. Uh, and you compound every six months, so in one year you've compounded twice. And then the exponent here would be 2t, this 2 for the n and then the t. And so this is a function that tells me how much money I have at any time period. If I want to know how much I have after one year, I would be evaluating a of 1. And so for a of 1, I, all I would do is say 100 times 1 plus 0.2 over 2. Well, 0.2 over 2 is 0.1, and 1 plus 0.1 is 1.1. So I get this thing right here. So A of 1 is figuring out what is, I guess I could have done that all in one step. How about that? To the 2 power, because 2 times 1 is just 2. Um, so what's going on here is I'm taking my $100 and I'm multiplying it by half of my interest rate. My interest rate was 20%. I'm kind of getting 10% of that first. So my 100 changes into $110. And then I get that 10% again. But it's not 10% on the $100, it's now 10% on $110. I get interest on the interest. And that's where I make out, that's where things work out nicely. So I start out with 100 bucks, and I make 10% interest. 10% of 100 bucks is 10 bucks. So now I got 110 bucks. And then I get 10% interest again, because it's compounding twice. So I get that 10% interest again, but now it's 10% interest on 110 bucks. 10% of 110 bucks is 11 bucks. So now I'm up to a total of $121. After one year, I have $121. And the point that I wanted to make is the interest rate in this example was 20%. Yet my effective yield was 21%. You made a higher rate than your annual percentage rate was. And that will always happen anytime n is a number greater than 1. So it's to your benefit to compound more frequently. So I compounded twice in this example, but you can consider another example where you compound, I don't know, 12 times, you compound monthly. And this would be 12 here. And you're like, well, if this is 12, this is going to be huge. I'm going to have all sorts of money. Well, it turns out you're not going to have that much more money because you're going to be dividing by 12 here and making this a lot smaller. It would be 100 times uh, 1 point and then whatever 0.2 divided by 12 is equal to. So some smaller number here raised up to the 12th power. And you'll end up with more than $121. It's to your benefit to compound more frequently. But it's not crazy. It's not like you end up with $500. You'll end up with like, I don't know, 130 bucks or something. So you might wonder where it ends, right? Okay, so that's if you compound monthly. What if you compound daily or minutely? That's a thing. Compound over and over again. Well, it turns out there's an answer to that question. Um, and it gives you another formula. It's what's called the continuous interest formula. I'm going to do something very slightly different than your book. So far, it's exactly like your book. The continuous interest formula, just like the compound interest formula, tells you how much you have at time t. Um, and you still start out with some amount. Your book changes. It uses an A here instead of a P. I think the P typically stands for principal, and this formula shows up in places other than just money, so they use the letter A. I think it makes more sense to be consistent with my variables, or with my... Um, parameters. So since this P means the exact same thing as this, what's here, I'm going to use the letter P here. And then I have an E. Well, what's E? Don't worry, I'll get there. Raised up to the R times T power. P is still P. R is still R. T is still T. All those things are the exact same. Like what is N? There is no N in this formula because down here you're not told how many times you compound. You're told that you compound continuously. So every second, if you want to think about it like that, you compound. Okay, so I guess I could use this formula. There's only one problem. What is E? Turns out E is a number. It's an irrational number, so I can't write it. Go on forever and ever. Um, but here's the first few digits of E. All you need to know is E is some number that's between 2 and 3. And that's all you need to know. If you can remember that's about 2.7, that's great. Good for you. It's like, a, like pi. It's an irrational number. So it's got this infinitely long decimal expansion. Uh, people get really excited about E. There's all sorts of stuff. That sounded weird. About the number E. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff. Maybe I'll make a whole other video dedicated to the things that people 
do with this number. Um, but our, for our purposes, all you have to know is that it's a number. It's about this number right here, and it'll be on your calculator. So when you're figuring out answers, if you have to evaluate how much money would you have, here I could figure it out, switch colors right here. Suppose that instead of the situation we had above here, where we were figuring out how much money you had if you compounded twice a year, let's do that exact same scenario, figure out how much you have after one year, except now instead of compounding semi-annually every six months, let's compound continuously. We're still starting out with 100 bucks, but now it's E raised up to the R times T. Well, the interest rate is still 20%, and T is still 1, so I have to calculate this thing right here. Uh, pull out a calculator, and we can figure out what this is equal to. I expect it to be some number greater than 121, because I'm compounding more frequently. Let's see what happens here. Let's take the 100, and I'll multiply it by, and this calculator, like your calculator should, will have a button that's E raised up to some exponent. You can kind of see it in yellow right here above the natural log key, E to the X. So if I just hit E to the X, it'll say E raised up to some power. What power do you want it raised up to? I want it raised up to the 0.2 power. Hit enter, and I get this number. Say approximately, oh, that was a bad idea, uh, 122.14. So I guess I was off before when I said more compounding will get you 130 bucks, because it won't. It'll get you something pretty close to this, 122 bucks. Um, if you compound this thing continuously every second, you'll get 122.14. So a little bit better, but not drastically different. Again, all you need to know is that there's a different formula that you use, and that formula is still a type of exponential function, um, but it uses as its base E. And this base is kind of the perfect base in some sense. You didn't just choose this number for something for no reason. This has a lot of meaning to it, and we'll explore that more meaning more deeply as we go on. I think that's about good. I think I'll end this video here.